<laughs> okay, Zoom has started. Good morning. Uh, my name is Shay Tripp. I am the Sarah Graham Keenan Curator of the Southern Historical Collection. And I just wanted to offer a few remarks from my vantage as a curator, as a collector in the Southern Historical Collection. And I have to say that last night and today have been very fortifying as I see the frequent users of our research room. Um, and in one case, a former student employee on the stage sharing their research journeys and advancing the study of the American South. So I was very honored to serve on the planning committee for this symposium. And when I had the chance to consider why these three papers could be on a panel together, the constant thread that I saw was suffering, human suffering. And this is really connected to my approach to the archive that you can't really divorce the papers from the people that are reflected in them and the importance of making the connections when we're doing the scholarship. Um, you know, we are no strangers to suffering in the Southern Historical Collection when we think about um, the accounts of war, slavery, and racial terrorism. Um, as archivists, we talk about vicarious trauma and the need for radical empathy as, um, as we try to make that suffering meaningful. One of my favorite colleagues, Holly Smith from Spellman likes to say, what makes the empathy so radical? Um, it's radical because it activates you and it spurs you to change. So whether it's the poisoning of natural resources, starvation due to drought, or excessive punishment from state actors, um, there are people in our region who are in a state of constant suffering. And this scholarship shines a kind of light that can impact the change that we want to see. So since um, I imagine those that are listening in here are at the session because of the themes and subjects uh, mentioned in these abstracts, I want to make sure that I direct you to more content in Wilson Library that can further your exploration. So when I think about environmental racism, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about our recent exhibition on um, the PCBs in Warren County and the protests in 1982. Uh, the exhibit, We Birthed the Movement, was co-curated with Warren County community members and my colleagues, Biff Hollingsworth, Linda Jacobson, and Stephen Fletcher. Um, a version of this exhibit is on display at the Stanford School of Public Policy at Duke University. Um, and so you can see materials, but you can also explore similar phenomenon with um, the case of the Alcoa plant in West Baden, North Carolina, or more instances of hog farming in Eastern North Carolina. And so there's such an interconnectedness of the stories. Um, when I think about food scarcity in the Mississippi Delta, I think about this directly based on, on my time with the historically black towns and settlements and our time in Mount, ba Mount Bayou, Mississippi. Um, resource scarcity is still a thing there in the 2020s. Um, here in the libraries, we have the papers of the Delta, Delta Health um, Center, Milburn Crow, and the Jack Geiger collection, which includes a digital copy of Out in the Rural, which is a short documentary um, that features footage of the living conditions of people in Mount Bayou in the 1970s. Um, I'm also working on a project at Cherry Hospital, which was um, an asylum for the colored insane, founded in 1877. And many of the admissions records require or cite pellagra as the condition um, for why those people were admitted, which further pathologizes, makes innately bad um, people just for being black and poor. And so these themes are, are all throughout our collections and our, our work in the archives. And finally, with regard to criminal justice, um, I would direct you to a Twitter thread, or X, I guess now. Um, we, in 2015, when Just Mercy was the campus read, um, we developed a hashtag, the Just Mercy syllabus, and it includes um, records from the Southern Historical Collection that uh, uh, describe connections between slavery, racial terrorism, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration. So this is available on social media. I just checked, it's still up there. Um, so hopefully these resource tidbits will be helpful for our audiences and, and really uh, further solidify the importance of connecting communities, archives, scholars um, around these topics. So. I will go ahead and introduce our uh, discussant, who is uh, 
a scholar of living history and community engagement, and also an assistant professor of African American history and public history at NC State University. And he will introduce the panelist, Ajamu Amiri Dillahunt Holloway. Thank you. Well, before we get into the panel, uh, I just want to say thank you to Wilson Library. Thank you uh, to Satra, because uh, even though I'm born and raised in Raleigh, uh, I'm a Wolfpack. I teach at NC State, and I'm an NC State fan. Uh, I have to admit that uh, I'm a UNC fan, too, uh, because of what Wilson Library has done uh, for me, what uh, UNC has done for me in terms of my development as a scholar. I had a chance to participate in MIRAP as an undergraduate at North Carolina Central University uh, and really dig deep into special collections, meet uh, archivists. Uh, and uh, now uh, what I'm working on now, Wilson Library is like my best friend. So thank you uh, to Wilson Library uh, for all that you do. You can't study the South uh, without visiting Wilson Library and spending most of your time there. So uh, we have three great panels and I, I must say uh, the Tar Heels must be uh, really excited because the three uh, presenters for this session are all graduates, undergraduate graduates of UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to hearing what the Tar Heels have to say. So we'll go in the, the list uh, as it uh, is in the program. And first we'll have Andrew Craig who uh, is a third year PhD uh, student in the history department at the University of Georgia. He's originally from Asheville, North Carolina. He received his BA in history from UNC and his MA from UNC Wilmington. Uh, he wrote his master's thesis on the development of integrated hog farms and the environmental crisis they created during the 20th century in Eastern North Carolina. His current project focuses on chemical fertilizers and post-Civil War, Southern agriculture and environmental racism in the early 20th century. Andrew. Thanks, Jamu. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to quickly say thanks to everybody who's worked on putting the symposium together, and uh, thanks to Wilson Library for their support of my research with the fellowship, uh, and thanks to you all for coming out today. Um, I am getting over a sinus infection, so I apologize if there's some extra sniffling during the presentation. Um, <clears throat> okay. Readers of the National Fertilizer Association's trade journal found two curious articles printed in October 1912 edition of Commercial Fertilizer. The first was a short article titled Negro Smellers Offended. In just nine lines it informed readers that seven lawsuits have been filed by black residents of Hattiesburg, Mississippi against the Meridian Fertilizer Factory in their town. They claimed that the factory had damaged their property in sums ranging from $500 to $800 and that it was a detriment to the good health of the community. A lengthier article titled Injunction Against Plant Building appeared directly above the journal's brief mention of the Hattiesburg cases. According to the article, four white property owners in Greenville, South Carolina, sought an injunction to stop the Carolina Phosphate Company from constructing a fertilizer factory nearby. Like Hattiesburg residents, the four Greenville property owners alleged the proposed factory would be injurious to the health of persons living upon the land, prevent the growth of vegetation, and damage the value of 800 acres they'd recently improved with a view of developing it as a residential site. As I've come to understand it by studying numerous nuisance lawsuits against fertilizer manufacturers across the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century, these two articles provide a glimpse into the ways phosphate fertilizer production changed Southerners' environmental consciousness. Fertilizer's role in the intensification of agriculture after the Civil War has often been recognized by historians who have highlighted its impact on land use practices, labor, and the environment. However, historians have yet to fully explore how the fertilizer fueled intensification of agriculture transformed the way Southerners thought about and responded to local changes, to changes in the local ecosystems. As agricultural production intensified and the Southern fertilizer industry grew in the post-war period, residents in Southern cities started to notice changes in their local environments. In response, mostly segregated groups of concerned citizens organized collectively and filed private nuisance lawsuits to protect their neighborhoods from pollution. By bringing their cases before state officials and local courts, they worked to gain legal protection from polluters like fertilizer factories by having them declared a public nuisance. Analyzing the difference between these nuisance lawsuits, like those apparent in the two articles mentioned earlier, can also help historians better understand the evolution of environmental racism in the South. Some lawsuits successfully convinced public officials to take action, 
Judges often paid more attention to the protests of middle-class white residents who voiced concerns about pollution and in some cases insisted on action. As we will see, fertilizer producers satisfied residents just enough, their coordinated movements relented and the pressures they put on fertilizer producers fizzled. However, many lawsuits failed, were settled out of court or were dismissed. Unsurprisingly, in the context of, Jim, of the Jim Crow South, judges and local officials' response to complaints against fertilizer factories and the success of these lawsuits by extension was often predicated on plaintiff's race and class. As the dismissal of the lawsuits brought by black residents of Hattiesburg demonstrates, court officials and fertilizer producers largely disregarded black residents' environmental concerns and left them with limited access to environmental remedies. As environmental activism, the response of residents to the ecological disruptions caused by the phosphate fertilizer industry can certainly seem like a far cry from the more radical response of environmentalists to agrochemical use and production after World War II. Residents do not largely refer to themselves as environmentalists. Barring the occasional reference to similar lawsuits against fertilizer manufacturers in other states, these protests were not coordinated by a regional or national organization. Despite the uncoordinated nature of their protests, property owners across the South mobilized in common cause and worked to protect their land and health from pollution. These lawsuits served as a tool for Southerners to express concerns over a changing environment, and we as historians must grapple with them on their own terms. Southerners articulated a historically specific environmental ethic in response to environmental threats that emerged as Southern land use practices changed after emancipation. In response to the Civil War's disruption of plantation agriculture, Planters, yeomen, and free people all abandoned traditional land use practices and changed the way they conceived of, manipulated, and organized their land. Emancipation also led planters scrambling for ways to replace the labor of formerly enslaved workers. The land management techniques performed by enslaved laborers, such as ditching, manuring, and clearing land to create new fertile fields, have enabled slaveholders to ignore environmental limitations such as soil fertility and erosion. Hoping to regain control over the southern landscape, Planters increasingly turned to chemical phosphate-based fertilizers to overcome the ecological limitations of exhausted soils and to turn a profit. The turn to fertilizer, which intensified after reconstruction, fueled the intensification of cotton and tobacco production across the South, which in turn further transformed the Southern landscape and regional land use practices. During the 1880s, Southern cities grew as fertilizer enabled the expansion of cotton and tobacco production. Businessmen established textile mills, cigarette factories, cottonseed oil mills, banks, and railroads to process and market the growing amount of southern cash crops. Many tenant farmers and sharecroppers migrated to these burgeoning urban centers, seeking better economic opportunities in such industries. At the same time, cotton and tobacco merchants provided funds with bankers and industrialists to erect fertilizer factories on the outskirts of even the smallest southern cities. The peripheral locations they chose for their factories also gave factory operators ready access to a supply of unskilled and predominantly black workers, who in some cases had moved to urban areas in the hopes of escaping oppressive sharecropping regimes. Becoming fertilizer producers gave Southern capitalists greater control over, over the circulation of capital and regional credit markets. As they started to produce the fertilizer that simulated the growth of cash crop yields throughout the region, fertilizer producers created new linkages between rural and urban South. Faced with constant price fluctuations and environmental threats like drought, blight, and the bull evil, many farmers trusted that fertilizer would enable them to at least break even. Folding into the vortex of agricultural intensification, indebted farmers became ever more dependent on cash crop production and fertilizer to turn a profit or increase their economic fortune. As demand grew between 1900 and 1915, consolidated fertilizer firms like the Virginia Carolina Chemical Company expanded rapidly into new geographic territories and erected new fertilizer factories along cotton compresses and cottonseed oil mills. Most Southern fertilizer factories used a process patented in the 1870s by Nathaniel Pratt, who expanded his work as a chemist in the Confederate Niter and Mining Bureau to develop an industrial method for manufacturing fertilizers. Making the phosphates mined in Tennessee, Florida, or Charleston usable was both a dirty and dangerous process that required workers to treat raw phosphate with a one-to-one -one solution of sulfuric acid. Given the dangers and difficulty of shipping these large quantities of acid, uh, many Southern fertilizer manufacturers produce acid on site. Using Pat's, Pratt's process, trained acid makers, who were typically older, literate black men, burnt either pyrates or sulfate or sulfur ores in large furnaces. Burning these ores produced large quantities of fine particulate matter, which had to be dust, excuse me, not matter, which had to be vented away from the other gases through a series of chambers 
uh, to external smokestacks to successfully produce the acid. As the clouds of fumes and dust settled into the surrounding landscape, they created hazards for anything living near 19th century factories. When a fertilizer company in the Charleston Neck began using Pratt's process just a few years after the Civil War, residents soon noticed changes in their local environment and sought remedies to the problems caused by factory pollution. In 1876, John Kennedy argued in front of a local judge that the Etowan Phosphate Company's sprawling four and a half acre, eight building factory was a nuisance. Kennedy's job as a huckster, hauling the produce he grew on his farm into the city's market, put him in a unique position to recognize the way fertilizer's production was transforming the local environment. Beyond noting the pernicious gases and noxious smells the factory emitted, Kennedy claimed the fertilizer factory fumes caused irreparable damage to his fields and home and injured the crops and trees that were his main source of income. At one phosphate, settled out of court with Kennedy for $2,250 and agreed to increase the height of their stacks to better diffuse the fumes. Though Kennedy agreed to refrain from future litigation in the settlement, he again appealed to the court in 1881 after recognizing that the pollution recurs with every season and that he, quote, lacked an adequate remedy at law. Despite lawsuits like Kennedy's, the success of Charleston fertilizer producers encouraged other entrepreneurs to follow their lead. As the industry consolidated and its power and presence grew in states like Georgia, North Atlanta residents became keenly aware of the environmental impact of the industry's intensification. In 1913, North Atlanta residents asked city officials to investigate the odors coming from Peachtree Creek, a well-known fertilizer factory dumping site. The investigation city engineers and public health officials conducted, along with the U.S. Supreme Court's recent decision on air pollution in Ducktown, Tennessee, sent the city's Chamber of Commerce and industry lawyers scrambling to ensure the fertilizer industry wouldn't be netted wouldn't be negatively impacted should residents continue to raise concerns. By 1915, New South boosters, eager to keep the city's modernizing image clean, started working with attorneys to develop legal defenses by following a series of test cases in local courts. These legal defenses were put to the test in 1917, when the New Jersey-based American Agricultural Company announced plans to erect a half million dollar fertilizer factory in the city's limits. The proposed factory would sit in the same neighborhood where just a few years earlier, Residents had complained about the pollution created by Armour and Company and the Morris Fertilizer Company's factories. With the risk intensifying, residents in the rapidly expanding middle class and suburban neighborhoods off Peachtree Street organized the Northside Citizens Committee to press suit and stop both factory construction and future polluting. At an organizational meeting held in September 1917, the Citizens Committee heard complaints from the community and outlined the legal steps they planned in response to the fertilizer factory nuisance. Numerous community members claimed the fumes were so bad that they frequently struggled to breathe. One local pastor complained and made his entire congregation, quote, cough all during service. After hearing from other residents, committee leaders J.J. Haverty and Jack Spaulding presented a resolution proposing two legal actions be taken to fight back against the fertilizer companies. Along with filing joint damage suits against the companies, they proposed hiring legal counsel to file, quote, papers of incorporation for the proposed town of North Atlanta in case the usual means of abating nuisances through legal means should fail. Fertilizer producers responded almost immediately to the Citizens Committee by launching a campaign in the press to defend itself against residents' claims. Executives of Morris Fertilizer claimed that they had installed every known device to control noxious fumes and deny that their factory has ever emitted from its works, deleterious, offensive, or injurious gases, which might cause injury to animal or plant life. After months of constant pressure from the Citizens Committee, an Atlanta judge granted a temporary injunction against the fertilizer companies and instructed them to take action to abate the fumes. The battle, however, drug on for many more months, as fertilizer manufacturers attempted to delay proceedings and refused to cooperate with the court's request for records. Finally, in February 1918, the fertilizer companies settled with Northside residents before a pending permanent injunction could be heard. In the deal brokered by Superior Court Judge George L. Bell, fertilizer companies agreed to, quote, engage services of expert chemists and me mechanical engineers to devise plans for the abatement of the nuisance before April, 19, April 15, 1919. Excuse me. Despite the settlement, fertilizer producers continued to delay taking action and ultimately failed to abide by the terms of the settlement. In April 1919, the state of Georgia brought contempt hearings against the Armour and Morris Fertilizer Companies for not taking reasonable steps to abate the nuisance. Less than a month later, George Bell declared the polluters guilty, which paved the way for members of the Citizen Committee to proceed with further lawsuits. There was not an improvement in the condition. 
The struggle against North Atlanta fertilizer producers seems to fade away after the court gave the Citizens Committee the power to determine the fate of the factories in 1919. If residents did file further suits, it's likely they ended the same way many fertilizer nuisance cases did in the South, an out-of-court settlement that made the issue disappear from the record in the public's attention. Fertilizer producers used the tactic of constantly delaying court appearances and court rulings to keep them from having to take meaningful actions to stop their polluting ways. By diverting public attention away from the lawsuits through settlements or small concessions like the installation of mostly useless technology, fertilizer producers ensured that the political will of communities died down and they continued to produce fertilizer. The suits filed by residents of Dilworth, an affluent suburb of Charlotte, against the Virginia Carolina Chemical Company provides another stark example of this trend. I wish I had more time to talk about this, but I'll skip over it for time. Um, in other nuisance lawsuits, uh, state judges who were seemingly sympathetic to uh, the fertilizer manufacturers refused to hear residents' appeals and dismissed the cases outright. This is particularly true in the cases filed by Black Southerners like the ones I mentioned earlier in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. After the eight Black homeowners filed lawsuits against the Meridian Fertilizer Factory in August 1912, initial hearings in the lawsuits were delayed based on the, quote, points of their merit. When a judge finally had an initial hearing on the cases a few weeks later, he issued a decree requiring the plaintiffs to provide security for the cost of litigation within 15 days before proceeding with formal hearings. By requiring working class black families to put up large sums of cash, judges in effect dismissed the cases. In the way of nuisance lawsuits that were filed across the South between 1911 and 1917, it becomes increasingly clear that white middle class residents had more leverage over fertilizer producers than black or working class communities did. By comparing the extent to which black working class residents of Hattiesburg and Atlanta's growing white middle class could generate a response from the courts, the legal outlines of environmental racism in the Jim Crow era begins to emerge. Fertilizer producers made promises and judges placed injunctions in response to white residents, which quieted these communities for long enough periods for the movements to die out. In many Southern cities, the economic and political importance of the fertilizer companies ensured that legislators and courts did little to make fertilizer factories stop their polluting. In communities where a black middle class was beginning to take shape like Hattiesburg, black residents' political power was not enough to make judges uh, take the same action they did against for white residents. When companies paid off white residents who were able to leverage enough political power to make courts act, the money they received compensated them for the loss of property value. Black residents who were not able to leverage the same political power to force Jim Crow courts to take action were never afforded the same economic benefit of rising real estate values over time because they were trapped in communities where pollution continued to build. In many ways, these lawsuits seem insignificant as they largely failed in their quest to stop the pollution. However, they force us to further question how the intensification of Southern agriculture changed Southern's relationship to the environment and the origins of the long struggle against environmental racism in the region as we seek equitable solutions to climate change today. After World War II, many Southern factories folded as Southern agriculture and the region's economy intensified in new ways. In towns like Nevada, North Carolina, however, Residents continued to work towards a remedy for the pollution left behind by the fertilizer industry well into the 21st century. Throughout the region today, many environmental justice activists continue to seek legal protections from the pollution generated by intensive agriculture by filing nuisance lawsuits against ag agribusiness operators. In many cases, officials and courts continue to respond in much the same way they did a century ago when residents voiced their concerns about the fertilizer industry's impact on their land. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Next, we have Dr. Uh, Dana Landris, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Medical History and Bioethics at the University of Wisconsin Madison School of Medicine and Public Health. Her research examines the relationship between uh, nutritional disease, community health work, and the political economy of capitalism in the South. Dr. Landris. Good morning. Working? Thanks. All right, good morning everyone and thank you all for being here today. Um, thank you to Chaitra and Ajamu as well for the generous introduction. Um, I also want to begin just by extending special thanks to the planning committee here, Matt, Nadia, Allison, Maria, and everyone here at UNC Library 
libraries for creating just an incredible doctoral fellowship program that has really been at the forefront of uh, Southern studies and that has welcomed so many scholars into the archives to benefit both from the amazing collections and the incredible expertise of the folks here at UNC. So thank you for building this scholarly community and thank you for bringing us into conversation today. In 1930, a severe drought spread slowly across the Delta, withering cotton crops and food crops and leaving thousands of sharecropping families without garden produce, without fresh foods or access to vital credit lines to purchase even the most basic kitchen staples at commissary stores. The flood arrived shortly on the heels of the 1927 Mississippi Delta flood, and the drought plummeted national cotton prices, creating conditions of food scarcity, and contributed to an outbreak of the nutritional deficiency disease called pellagra. Now, pellagra is a vitamin deficiency disease marked by an absence of the vitamin B3 niacin. But in structural terms, pellagra is the quintessential example of poverty-induced malnutrition. As you can see from the mortality statistics compiled from the Mississippi Department of Archives and History behind me, pellagra rates were highest during moments of economic and environmental catastrophe. The 1927 flood, the 1929 stock market crash, and of course the 1930 drought. As you can also see from this data set, African Americans in Mississippi and other Delta states were disproportionately impacted by pellagra due to longstanding mechanisms of structural racism that systematically challenged access to food, including things like predatory credit sch uh, schemes, high interest rates, and a land tenure system which embodied many of the features of what historian of the South Pete Daniel has called feudal peonage. As the drought began to spread over the Delta, the U.S. Surgeon General Hugh Cumming wrote to Herbert Hoover, quote, the drought in the South is indecent to the economic chaos in which the whole region appears to have sunk. The problem is primarily due to the drop in the price and availability of cotton, which has brought about food scarcity in the South. This is what is causing pellagra, unquote. So across the Delta, preventable health crises were born out of cotton monoculture, out of environmental disaster, and out of the afterlives of plantation racial capitalism. Now, as I mentioned, pellagra is a disease of chronic malnutrition caused by prolonged deficiencies of the vitamin B3 niacin. The vast majority of pellagra cases in the first half of the 20th century were concentrated here in the U.S. South. And many scholars have focused on the Southern diet of meat, meal, and molasses, the three M's, as the underlying structural cause of pellagra. And yet I think perhaps we have attributed too much of this causal story to food choices without critically examining the environment and the political and economic context in which food scarcity was systematically created and reproduced, including the food ration system overseen by the Red Cross during the drought of 1930. Indeed, the biopolitical disciplinary power of determining who could eat and under what circumstances was exemplary of what the environmental theorist Rob Nixon has called slow violence. Poverty-induced malnutrition, and its uneven distribution of morbidity and mortality rates was indeed a form of slow help violence marked by pellagra's recurrent symptoms of exhaustion, lethargy, disorientation, and eventual death, again caused by chronic nutrient deficiencies. The Southern literary critic Patricia Yeager has fittingly described pellagra as, quote, a sign of permanent emergency within the body politique. And the drought of 1930 was certainly an emergency, but it underscored longstanding political and economic arrangements that had for decades made hunger a leading health problem here in the South. As the historian Nan Woodruff has shown by 1930, more than 70% of all Red Cross clients participated in cotton tenancy, the vast majority of them working as sharecroppers, the most economically precarious of all labor arrangements. The historian Caitlin Rosenthal has argued, quote, plantation spaces were historically privatized, held outside of the law, but within the owner's control, end quote. 
And planters for their part had learned from the 1927 Mississippi Delta flood that they could co-opt federal and philanthropic food aid, often withholding food crops until the cotton had been planted. Indeed, it was only after the harvest had been made that planters would frequently distribute Red Cross food rations to tenants who were deemed to have produced enough cotton. Around this same time, a report from the Works Progress Administration administrator noted, quote, all WPA projects in the Delta have been suspended indefinitely in order to provide the cotton pickers for distressed plantation owners, end quote, after the planters complained that these federal projects use workers ordinarily available for cotton picking, end quote. So in many ways, this drought laid the groundwork for future federal subservience to cotton's major power brokers uh, when it came to food access and availability and this is a trend that would continue well into the mid 20th century. Behind me, you can see that the Red Cross collected data on the amount and kind of crops that workers and recipients were producing. Organizational correspondence from the National Archives suggests that labor output was a key factor in determining the kind and quantity of relief to be distributed to Red Cross clients. Thus, the drought led plantation owners to capitalize upon the lessons that they had learned during the 1927 flood. That the disaggregated nature of federal relief programs in the early days of the New Deal allowed planters to co-opt food resources that had entered disaster zones as a gift economy. That's really important. Entered as a gift economy and that they had used them then to incentivize labor output. I believe that this story is a quintessential example of what the scholar Olafime Taiwo has termed elite capture. And the Black press plays a critical role in highlighting the injustices of federal drought relief in this story. Behind me, you can see a cartoon from the Chicago Defender, the caricature of a white Southern planter, quite literally squeezing sharecroppers and tenants dry. And as I'll show in a moment, this is particularly salient given the wave of labor organizing and agricultural coalition building that was happening in the South, given the groundswell in the 1930s. Now in the wake of the drought, the Red Cross proposed to offer displaced sharecroppers garden seeds. You can see a package of these here. A solution which was strained at the outset, given the impossibility of growing a garden successfully amid one of the worst environmental disasters of the 20th century. And of course, the underlying message of garden seeds was that the problem of food scarcity was an individual problem, not a structural problem, one that ought to be combated by better, more efficient, more scientific, and more technical farming of this period. The second public health solution proposed by the Red Cross during this period was the free distribution of brewer's yeast, which had been discovered in the early 1920s at the National Hygienic Laboratory in Washington, DC, to temper the symptoms of pellagra beginning in 1922. And yet the problem with brewer's yeast was its immense unpalatability. And the fact that many patients, surprise, I know, refused to continue the regimen, the two week regimen, three tablespoons per day, every day, with one woman actually claiming, quote, it has the consistency and the flavor of the stone gravel on the roadside outside of my house, end quote. Um, and yet the Red Cross uh, poses this as sort of the leading solution to the plague epidemic in the South and the context of the drought. Now, food, of course, is the most efficient, practical, and efficacious means of combating nutritional deficiency disease, but access to food is highly politicized and often weaponized by the Red Cross, a reality which be Fred McDowell uh, conveys poignantly in his Red Cross so uh, blues song. And just to give you an example of how food is becoming weaponized in this instance, I want to give you a quick story uh, coming from Lone Oak County, Arkansas. In January of 1931, two black sharecroppers in Lone Oak County were arrested for obtaining food rations under false pretenses. One of the men was suffering from pellagra, that was 70-year-old Bob Avery, who had submitted his application for Red Cross food rations through the local white Red Cross County chairman. Now, the credentials on Avery's ration application were signed by R.G. Kirk, a local white plantation owner who had employed Avery. Two days before Christmas, on December 23rd, 1930, Avery went to the local supply depot and picked up food rations for himself, his wife, and his three children. An unidentified informant told the local sheriff that Avery was not in need of food rations, and a search warrant was executed on Avery's property 
Law enforcement found three barrels of flour, 20 pounds of lard, and a handful of homemade canned fruits and vegetables from the family's garden put away for winter. Avery was arrested and was given a hearing in front of a local white jury who deemed that such provisions were, quote, too excessive for one family, end quote. Avery was then forced to return the food back to the Red Cross store. So the weaponization of food by philanthropic organizations and the role of law enforcement in this kind of surveillance and oversight of food rations becomes a major catalyst in Southern labor activism. According to reports from the Arkansas State Board of Health in 1930, pellagra was one of the leading causes of death. In 1926, to give you a bit of context, pellagra had constituted 31% of all cases reported to the State Board of Health. By September of 1930, pellagra constituted 57% of all cases of all diseases reported to the State Board of Health, far surpassing typhoid, tuberculosis, and smallpox rates, and thereby making pellagra a leading cause of death in the context of the drought. Now, in January of 1931, the Red Cross store in Lone Oak County, Arkansas, where Avery had been arrested, ran out of ration forms, and this was a technical prerequisite for the receiving of food. Hundreds of sharecroppers descended upon the town of England, Arkansas, protesting the directive that they wait for additional forms before they could receive any food. In three months alone, from January to March of 1931, at least four instances of food protests led by sharecroppers were recorded across the state of Arkansas. And such a Experiences became a major catalyst in the formation of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union in 1934, which the historian Robin G.G. Kelly has written extensively and beautifully about. Indeed, many of the founders of the STFU wrote about their experiences with food scarcity, and many, including African-American labor organizer John Allen and white labor organizer Myrtle Terry Lawrence, had experienced pellagra in their families firsthand, thereby making food access and availability central platforms of the early organizing work of the STFU. So what I hope to add to this conversation is the critical role of food in shaping labor activism in the early 1930s, and I think the signs behind me illustrate this well, linking discourses around food access, civil liberties, equitable wages, and working conditions to early discourses around human rights. Indeed, it was not a coincidence that the very first place in which the Red Cross tested its yeast regimen for pellagra among 200 sharecroppers was the same location where the Southern Tenant Farmers Union was formed in 1934. Despite many medical advertisements of the period from the Fleischmann's company, yeast was not food, and it certainly was not an efficacious medicine for the treating of the structural causes of pellagra. I want to end by sharing a couple of incredible photographs from the Farm Security Administration. During the drought, the pellagra epidemic rendered conditions of labor, health, and racial inequality hyper-visible to state and federal actors and to the American public writ large. At stake were issues such as the degree of oversight and cooperation that federal and state governments should have in the regulation of health resources. The contests and coalitions between such entities represented fundamental questions about the nature and scope of public health work in the South. As the historian Michael Katz has asked of poverty, so we might ask, what kind of a problem is hunger and what entities ought to be responsible for addressing it? Hunger, of course, was and remains political, I would argue, because hunger is a proxy. It is a proxy for poverty, it is a proxy for the social safety net, for issues of labor and civil rights, for healthcare infrastructure, and for racial discrimination and continued barriers in access to healthcare. The 1930 drought illustrates how powerful economic interests came to shape public health programming across the 20th century, and conversely, how the public health crisis of pellagra became framed as an individual rather than a structural economic problem. The historian Merlin Chakwanian has observed, quote, by locating the social factors, human agents, decision-making, and the exercise of political power behind them, we are reminded that health disparities are not natural, but created, and thus undoable, however awesome the task, end quote. 
by illustrating how structural health disparities are the result of complex histories, policies, institutions, and practices, historians of the, cell, of the South can help to denaturalize these disparities and open new possibilities for more just, equitable, and food secure future. For now, however, I would pose to you that hunger was and still remains a litmus test for the state of democracy in America. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Landris. Now uh, we have a presentation from Dr. Kanisha Johnson, uh, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow uh, in the Carolina Postdoctoral Program for Faculty Diversity. Uh, Dr. Johnson earned her BA in Political Science from UNC Chapel Hill, her MLS from the University of Chicago Law School, and her PhD in Government from Harvard University. Her research focuses on the ways in which the state designs systems of punishment, uh, as a form of social control and how people who are subject to those forms of control respond at the local level. Dr. Johnson. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, whenever I'm in a room of historians, I realize how good you are at storytelling. And I'm in political science, and I am not good at storytelling. So we're just going to see how this goes. Um, so again, thank you to everyone who was part of organizing this conference. Thank you to Dr. Dilia Hunt Holloway for reading my obnoxiously long paper. I appreciate you. <laughs> um, and as was invoked in the introduction, I want to extend gratitude and solidarity to those who have been victim of the oppressive systems that we are discussing today. Um, so I, I started this project, my dissertation project, a few years ago, before I'd ever stepped foot into an archive, and I was talking to a group of black men in Durham, and I was asking them questions around their experience in prison, um, and how, how that affected how they view the state and politics, etc. And during these discussions, they kept bringing up other forms of punishment that they'd experienced. They're like, yeah, I've been in prison, but I've also been evicted from my home. My kids got kicked out of school, all of these things. So then it, it really dawned on me that I, the way that I had been looking and thinking about punishment was very narrow. And that's part of my discipline of political science. If you say punishment, you think of prisons and policing, and we really need to extend that. So there are, just to situate what I'm going to talk about today within my larger project, there are three parts. The first is like a normative discussion of what we mean when we talk about punishment or state violence. The second is the development of social services and how punishment has been ingrained in those systems. And then the third is how community organizations and people who have been victim to this respond and how do they, how do they overcome these systems that have been imposed upon them. So I'm just going to tell you what I think about when I when I think about state punishment. So at the moment, when we think about punishment, we think of, you know, someone getting arrested or getting sent to prison. But really, an individual can experience many forms of punishment on themselves. So let's imagine someone who had their utilities get disconnected, they're incarcerated and arrested. So that's at the individual level. We can also think of it at the community level. So we might imagine a small neighborhood where half of the people have been arrested, a few of them have been incarcerated, some, some more of them have had their utilities cut off. But if we don't think of punishment as a web that has been developed together, well, then we're never going to really understand how these punishments build for different communities. So when I say punishment, that's what I mean, just so we're all on the same page. Um, so the historical part of, of this project is, is kind of in four different chunks. The first chunk is what did social services look like in North Carolina before there was before anything existed at the, at the centralized level? So this was during the colonial period, the revolutionary period, um, and it was really defined by identifying or distinguishing strangers and neighbors. So in 1755, the North Carolina General Assembly passed an act called the Restraint of Vagrants and the Making of Provision for the Poor and Other Purposes. And this was the first time that the state allocated resources for the provisions of the poor. So the act provided for traveling paupers or other idle people who could not return to their county, they, they gave them money to send them back. Um, or or they, were, they were put into a home where they could, they could do honest labor. Um, and then after this period, there was then a distinction between the deserving and undeserving poor. So the deserving, those who were considered deserving of aid included, uh, I'll just go back. Okay, okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so the people who were considered deserving of aid included widows or people who were sick, while the undeserving included the idle or the drunk. Um, 
And then at the close of the Civil War, it resulted in this national swell of attention to the shifting or the threat of a shifting social hierarchy. So previous arguments around public welfare spending um, focused on the need to contain re and reform the undeserving poor and those who were convicted of crimes. Um, and the abolition of chattel slavery in 60, 1865 introduced a new racial dynamic in, in figuring out who was deserving of aid from the state. So nationally, we can see calls to the white population to be aware of the dangers of miscegenation, the black voter and the Freedmen's Bureau. And then in North Carolina specifically, um, there was also an invoke of this racial threat and urged the poor white man to demand assistance from the state so that they did not sink to the status of the black person. So um, appearing in, in a lot of newspapers at the time, there was an invoking of this fear. So there was one quote saying, poor white men of North Carolina, working men of North Carolina, we appeal to you to save your children. And that appeal worked. <laughs> um, in 1868, North Carolina had the Constitutional Convention where they had to rewrite the Constitution in order to regain entry into the Union. And within that um, Constitution, there was the uh, North Carolina Board of Public Charities, and they were tasked with building out all social services in the state and prisons. So schools, prisons, uh, public assistant, you name it, they were the ones who were going to be who were going to be in charge of building that out. And this was not this was not confined to North Carolina at all. There was the, um, the National Convention of Public Charities, and you can see that across the country, not just in the South, um, there were similar boards being built. And interestingly enough, there was always a coupling of charities and prisons. So it was like charities and corrections. Um, you can see the names here, I won't go through them. Um, but this was very much a, a national phenomenon, not just within North Carolina. So that was phase one. Um, phase two, was of this centralized social service development was defined by a massive expansion in the services available within the state but at the same time there was an explicit exclusion of black people from being able to access these services. So just some examples of the services that propped up in this time. Uh, the board was renamed. It was given a huge amount of money in 1917. Um, they started to publish a monthly periodical available to the public to describe what was happening within social, social and public services at the time. Um, the juvenile courts were adopted. Mother's Aid, which was one of the original public assistance programs in the country, um, abolition of flogging in prisons, etc. It really was just a period where there was a ton of stuff being developed for, for white residents in the state. Um, so just to give you a sense of how large, like how big the expansion of public assistance was during that time, up here you can just see f uh, figures from four different programs. So these are numbers collected from uh, monthly reports from the board. So aid to dependent children and old age assistance during this time, there was a huge increase in the number of people who could get it. Um, so as I said before, there was an explicit exclusion of black people from being able to access these services. So instead of incorporating them into the, into the services that are existing, um, the board created this thing called the Division of Work Among Negroes. And so this was in 1924, this was created. And, and that overlooked all welfare for black people within the state, though it received no funding at all from the state. They, they got a Rockefeller grant of about $4,000 within the first few years of its operation. And in 1929, Kathleen Warren, who is the superintendent um, in Cherokee County, um, said that, I wish to remind you that approximately one third of the total population of North Carolina are Negroes. Suppose we leave the Negro alone in his ignorance, his superstition, his immorality, and his propensity to do evil without any attempt to guide him in the way that he should go as a member of civilized community. And the chances are certain that he will become a very dangerous and costly member of society once he starts on this downward path. So the, even when there was something created for these black people, it wasn't to give them services, it was to control how they were acting and to, to shape them to be um, who, who the white population, who the people in power wanted them to be. Um, they, the, the division of work among Negro, Negroes were really, they were most active at the county level, um, and because they didn't receive any funding, it was really within, it was really down to their community to develop all the services for themselves. So they would, they would have fundraisers to build out schools and hospitals, et cetera. And although it seems sad, these communities were so vibrant and, and had just like, the things that they were doing were incredible, and I'm going to touch on that in a minute because it's not all—it's not all doom and gloom. 
Um, so by the end of the 1950s, the board really had become an umbrella for all social services in the state. So you can kind of see up here the vast expanse of what they were dealing with. It was public education, um, institutions and corrections, division of mental hygiene, et cetera, et cetera. So when I, so what I'm trying to get a point and what I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to convince you all of is that when we're thinking about punishment, when we're thinking about prisons, the same people who are building out the prisons were also building out all of these other social services within the state, which is why I want to convince everyone to think about punishment the way that I'm talking about it today. Um, the third phase um, is where there was a desegregation of social services. So after Brown versus Board, um, public schools were forced to desegregate, but so was everything else. Um, and at the same time when this happened, we see a huge, a huge rise in how punitive these policies and social services were. Um, and the, the governor even said quite loudly with his chest to the people of North Carolina, we are determined to main, who are, are, the people of North Carolina are determined to maintain their society as it now exists with separate and distinct racial groups in the North Carolina community. So just some examples of some informal punitive policies. This is from the United Organizations for Community Improvement, which is based in Durham. And the Durham Public Housing Authority um, were, were really just going after and evicting black people in the Haiti community for no reason really at all. It was down to the caseworker. And within these papers, you can see examples of just arbitrarily raising rent about 300%, um, kicking people out, making up stories about why they shouldn't be, be able to stay. Um, and that was rife across the whole of the state at the time. Um, we also see a rise in formal punitive policies within the criminal legal system. So just looking at the session laws, if you look at a mention of um, is convicted of a felony or charged of a felony, just to get a sense of when new laws were made, around this time there was a huge, a huge increase in the number of felonies that someone could be charged with. Um, again, we see punitive policies rise in public assistance, and as I mentioned before, there was a big rise in um, the number of people who had, who had access to certain programs, but there was also a huge amount of denial that was happened. So in this third phase, you see that uptick of the number of applications that were denied. And the NAACP also noted this um, and, and, and were flagging some of the really punitive restrictions that they were imposing, such as if a woman was found to have a man living in the house, um, they would be ineligible to receive mother's aid. Um, at the same time, there was this thing called the eugenics board created. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, this is all really sad. <laughs> um, and then around that time, we just see a huge number um, of operations and sterilizations happening. It was also for a brief period of time, if, if a woman was considered um, of, of low intelligence, then they would have to be sterilized in order to receive any kind of public assistance. So I've spoken about this historical development. What, what about today? So as I said before, political science and the social sciences tend to think of just the criminal legal system when we talk about punishment. And this graph would tell you that that is correct. So that toolbar on, on the far left are the number of arrests that happened in North Carolina in 2020. And then I've also listed an extra few um, punishments or state violence that can happen. So we've got school punishments, we've got FNS, so food and nutritional services or food stamp denials, um, utility disconnections, et cetera, it goes on. But we kind of have to standardize this, right? And I'm gonna try and talk through this fast because this is the political science coming out and I know I'm in a room of historians, um, but not everyone is gonna be subject to all of those punishments, right? Like I wouldn't be subjected to getting denied food stamps because I'm never gonna apply for food stamps. So you've got the general population, you've then got a subset of that group who would be, who are, who are open to being punished and then you have the punished people. So when we standardize that, then it looks very different. So on the right, you can see the, the most likely punishment that people are coming into contact with are food stamp denials. Then it is school punishment. So has your child been suspended or excluded from a public school? Then it's arrest, then it's utility disconnections, evictions, et cetera. And I think it's quite small, so I'll just say it out loud. For every, in 2020, for every 1,000 applications that were put in for food stamps, 295 were denied. So this is just a very common thing that's happening. And I'm gonna try and end with a bit of an upbeat note because this has all been quite sad. And that is to say that the way that, the, the, the good that I have felt at the end of this project is that by, by understanding the vast web of how the state is imposing violence and punishment on people, yes, it's really sad, but also we can see the vitality and the, 
the conviction and the strength of these communities. So the last part of my dissertation looks at how those communities are combating these systems and, and overcoming oppression. And that's really a wonderful thing to like end on and, and realize that although the state has designed these things to oppress and control, nevertheless, um, black people and poor people are always gonna, gonna do what, what they need to do to fix it. So with that, I'll say thank you. Just like last time, when the screen goes up, we'll go up too. And uh, I'm eager uh, to hear what uh, questions there are, so I'll keep my remarks brief. And uh, I'm going to take the format from the last session, ask one question, uh, and then uh, open it up. So we'll get started. All right, we're live. Uh, so the, these sessions, these uh, uh, these papers, these presentations, I think uh, were very powerful. Uh, and as a public historian and someone who sees history uh, in service of the present, I couldn't stop thinking about this could be today. This is relevant uh, today. These topics are, are things that we're continuing uh, to struggle with today. So I offer my uh, feedback uh, in that uh, spirit uh, and my questions in that spirit too. And I think what we heard today from uh, the, the presenters is that uh, the study of the South is not just about understanding the South, but it's about transforming the South. Uh, it's about improving the South uh, and building a stronger and more fair, more just uh, type of South. Uh, and these presentations have done that. And so we get a story about, uh, uh, three stories about uh, race, uh, about public health, uh, about labor, about the environment, about the punishment. Uh, Dr. Johnson really took us uh, into understanding our state's history. Uh, and her presentation really forces us to interrogate uh, the very being of certain institutions uh, within our state. Uh, it made us look at punishment. Uh, we're in an era, of course, uh, where the fight against police violence and the fight uh, against prisons uh, and this question of abolition is, is really uh, taken off and organizations and movements have been developed. Uh, but Dr. Johnson research takes us a step back and says, okay, uh, we, we need to, to look at it in a more uh, broader perspective, a more full perspective, uh, if we're gonna really fight and transform uh, the wrong that has been done. And Dr. Uh, Landris you know, takes us uh, to Alabama uh, and looks at the question of labor uh, and health. Uh, and takes us to a story that, you know, uh, as, as she mentioned, Robin D.G. Kelly uh, has really unpacked, but makes us look at it uh, from this question of food, of nutrition, of, of disaster. Uh, and I think really forces us to uh, look at labor in a different perspective. You know, there's this trend uh, among labor historians to look at labor as only being the trade union movement. So only uh, within uh, the union structure, but she forces us uh, to look at how workers were dealing with other questions beyond the workplace. And so if you're going to talk about labor or the labor movement, you have to understand these other movements, these other systems and uh, the larger world that exists. Uh, and then uh, Andrew uh, takes us uh, deep into this question of the environment. Uh, deep into this question of the legality of the environment, and it it takes us when I heard when I hear Hattiesburg when I was in Mirap, I studied uh, studied under uh, Dr. William Sturkey, uh, who was a former professor here and now uh, is at UPenn uh, and is a great person. But his book is on Hattiesburg, and what Andrew does is takes us into Hattiesburg from the environmental uh, perspective, how the community was not you know. Uh, it wasn't just about civil rights, but it was also about EJ, uh, environmental you know, justice and protecting uh, the community. And it offers a, an understanding for us, especially around this question of uh, the legality of fighting against environmental racism uh, and what that means for us today uh, and where do we go from there. And so my, my questions, uh, I'll go in the order of, of, of presentation. So Andrew, can you uh, talk with, to us more about how these communities 
uh, went beyond just the legal framework uh, of things? And how did they build organizations? It, was that the case or uh, were were they uh, looking to adopt other strategies and tactics when the courts uh, weren't working for them? Yeah, so um, that actually is something I've, I've been working on since uh, the summer and, and being here at Wilson for, for my part of the fellowship, uh, trying to figure those questions out and sort of where they go. Um, a lot of the movements that I've sort of seen around the nuisance lawsuits uh, fizzle, as I sort of mentioned, um, in the late 1910s, and I, they don't seem to sort of come back in any shape or form again, um, and it's sort of hard to track them down. Uh, beyond the court reporters and uh, what few sort of court records I can find. Um, <clears throat> so just so trying to piece together that that puzzle is is what I'm working on now. Um, I, I think there's some other concerns that sort of eclipse that as well. And I think uh, Dana sort of made that case as well, right? And you sort of see drought and uh, food being a, a larger issue as well. Um, so Part of my speculation is that there are other concerns that sort of eclipse those in, in the immediate. Um, and we don't see them sort of resurface again until the 50s and 60s, but hopefully I'll find an answer, a better answer to that soon. So, And now I want to uh, add a, another brief question, question to that. So what, what does uh, your work around uh, this question of environmental uh, racism in the South tell us about the EJ movement today in the South? What are, what are some things the movement should be should be looking at what should we be taking into consideration based on? Sure, I think um, the thing that stand out for me is sort of uh, the answer of technology being a solution to the problem that technology is creating. Right, uh, it's in the fertilizer cases, and then in my research, uh, sort of on hog farming in North Carolina as well. Right, there's this sort of constant promise that uh, technology can find a solution that can sort of keep these industries working uh, and, and solve the solutions that are being caused in these areas. And so I think that's one of the issues. Uh, and then uh, it's sort of another thing that comes to mind is um, uh, sort of accounting for the role that race is playing in in in, in these problems uh, and sort of why people are in these places and uh, why better solutions are not being had sort of in those those areas. If that makes sense. Uh, thank you. And Dr. Landris, I, I want to uh, uh, turn uh, to you now. Can can you uh, tell us about uh, since we are coming out of COVID uh, and the question of health is. Uh, very important. And we're also in a very exciting time uh, of labor, but we're also in an important time uh, when it comes to the question of food and the lack thereof food, this question of food deserts and food apartheid. Can, can you tell us, uh, talk more about uh, what we should be looking out for or what does your study of the past tell us about uh, labor, food, public health in the present and and where we should go, because disaster seems to be uh, something that uh, we won't be able to get away from. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that um, really terrific question, a lot to unpack. And I think the question of health inequalities has really been on everyone's mind lately in the context of COVID. Something I've been thinking about in sort of transforming this project, which the book actually ends um, in 1968. So it sort of takes this discourse around food deserts and the plantation as a space of uh, a food desert into the 1960s, um, looking at, at lawsuits there. But something that I've been thinking about in sort of a more contemporary context is kind of the story of the global South um, in food access and inequality. And so in the 1990s, you have the French uh, Corporation Nutriset, uh, which introduces um, Plumpy Nut, uh, peanut butter, sort of like texture. It costs them about two cents per package to ship uh, to global disaster zones, places like Angola and Malawi in the late 90s and early 2000s, which were facing drought and food shortages and all these sorts of things. And um, this actually Plumpy Nut was subsidized in part by research through the Gates Foundation. And so I think there's a lot of questions still to be reckoned with when we talk about food access and availability in the global south today. Um, and I think the underlying question of this project and of sort of the contemporary afterlives of the project is what counts as a public health solution um, for whom and under what circumstances and um, what what happens when we don't agree <laughs> with the discourses around what counts as, as food access and availability in terms of solutions. And so thinking about the role of public health um, in, in the south today but also in the global south, I think has been a really central driving factor. And as I move to what is hopefully the end of this project soon. 
We on? Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you uh, for for that. And so now I'll turn to to Dr. Johnson. And uh, I know uh, we want to do questions with the audience, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep mine brief. I'm not gonna ask you know uh, more questions, even though I have more. Uh, but I'll save it for for after the session. So, Dr. Johnson, can you uh, talk to us um, about how this looked and this broad understanding of punishment? Um, in the 1980s, because oftentimes that is seen as, you know, the, the spark point of, you know, mass incarceration at a very high scale. Uh, so how at the same time in the 1980s were uh, people um, experiencing other forms of punishment uh, that you talk about? And then can you talk a little bit about the aspects of resistance and people building organizations in terms of mass incarceration, but also in terms of these other uh, forms of punishment that exist too? Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so the current state of the project ends before that period. <laughs> but I will just say that part of the reason I wanted to extend it back, because that was the time like with the, the crime bills that were happening at that time, like that's what people focus on is like the, the beginning of where we are today. But it's not <laughs> like the, the beginnings of what we're seeing now happened like when when we tore down the institution of slavery. So if we take seriously um, the need for abolition instead of reform. Like if we think about the institution itself as being the problem rather than policies that are created later on, then I, th for me, that that gives a really compelling case as to like to just to tear the systems down. Um, uh, that's my abolitionist lens rather than my <laughs> neat academic lens. Um, and then like the community resistance. So the and yeah. So when I'm talking about like these broader experiences of punishment, I am not the first person to say this at all. Like people who have been organizing in these spaces, abolitionist spaces like Radical Black Thought, they know this. And we can see that in the organizing that was happening. Like, and just the tactics that were used are so innovative. So in Durham, there's a woman called Anne Atwater that I'm sure many people know about. And, and around all of these like unjust evictions that were happening and at water in addition to like doing the incarceration stuff was just like okay we just need homes for our people so she went to the county welfare office got her friends to distract the clerk jumped over the counter <laughs> got the manual like xeroxed it and then handed it out in her community because she knew that like what they're doing is wrong and we just have to make sure that everyone is equipped with the knowledge to counter this so so really just looking at like the the smaller communities in which it's happening they they know very well like the problems that are facing their communities and they know that it's multifaceted um so yeah sorry if that was a cop out to your question no, that, that was great that was great uh, thank you all again and uh Shaitra, do we have time for questions for the six minutes so one or two, it, it, there's, there's one or two out there. We'll Thank you. Thank you all for your great presentations. Um, this one's for Kanisha, and I want to say that you are a great storyteller, despite what you <laughs> um, But I want to know your thoughts about sort of extra legal violence, um, and I'm, of course, in the turn of the 20th century, thinking about lynchings and things like that. Um, that you know are, are on the outside of this, um, these effective, um, uh, just things like imprisonment and arrest, things like that, punishments. I guess I should say. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, the, a lot of the time there's like a blurring between the two, right? But the reason that I just specifically wanted to talk about state punishment, one is because I couldn't possibly do all punishments. <laughs> That's just too much. There's a lot of punishment happening in this country. Um, so the I, I was very explicit, and part of this came from when I was talking to these group of black men in Durham, just because I wanted to really decipher, okay, how, how specifically is the state, the state violence different from everything else? So, we, and I'll give you a bit of background. Um, within political science, we really care about voting um, and like the experience of the state and just like whether or not that impacts whether or not people vote. So I just wanted to specifically to think about state violence, but I think that there's always a blurring and a lot of the time I just had to be very strict of just like these are also extra experience of violence that are happening on these communities, but it's like from a different actor. So I didn't include it in that, but, but yeah, it's a huge part of it. Any other questions? Uh, I really have to This is also for Dr. Johnson. You mentioned briefly the eugenics board. 
I know there were referrals from uh, prisons and from the county welfare offices. Did you have you seen any from like sheriffs or local policing authorities that would refer for possible sterilization? Yeah, no, I haven't. Um, I know that the papers on the eugenics board is very sparse in the like the state libraries have a lot of it, but a lot of it is redacted and you can't see like specific instances. So really you just get like a whole piece not like summary top line stuff. So I didn't I didn't see any, but but I think that there's such strong collaboration between like the sheriff's department, the police and the welfare office that that wouldn't surprise me. Because a lot of the time I can imagine that the police might be called for someone who's acting a certain way, then they'll refer them to do this or yeah so I can imagine there's a lot and I think that that's a really good point but I, I haven't seen it yet I'm sure it exists somewhere or uh, oh, shake your hands Okay, um, so my question is for Andrew, because I'm really familiar with the community of Navassa, North Carolina, and it's guano factories and fertilizer and the brown fun site, like it's totally right. toxic there. And I just wonder if, and I think about um, what it takes to mount a lawsuit and how, what kind of capital you need to have. And I just wonder if there's um, any research that you've done about how money or black leadership impacts um, how communities can fight the companies and get some redress for the um, pollution. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know the Navassa case and sort of, it, they actually, is, there's not one sort of in the period that I've looked at currently and that sort of, that organization around that happens in around the 90s. Um, so I haven't looked at that one as extensively, but I think that's a great question. So thank you, I'll definitely consider that. Thank you so much for those presentations. Um, I guess my question combines um, both uh, Andrew's and Dr. Landers's question or presentations. Um, do you see a role for sort of people who would have a special interest in these? So thinking through like international guano harvesters, do they end up showing up in any of the court records and sort of along the same lines, do the yeast makers or the niacin sort of producers in general um, decide to play a more active role in the collective action. So you see alliances from sort of people who um, have a commercial interest in um, the collective action. Uh, so I'll say really quickly for guano workers, um, it is brought up consistently that uh, particularly in Peru, uh, they're using primarily Chinese labor uh, to harvest the guano. Um, and uh, it is sort of cited that there's a lot of cases of illness uh, in loading it onto ships uh, and and sort of similar complaints of, of uh, respiratory illness and sort of irritation from that process. Uh, those are cited in those cases, uh, but they don't seem to gather a lot of traction sort of beyond, um, beyond sort of brief mentions. Um, so there's not, there doesn't seem to be a lot of coalition building between that, um, but it is sort of mentioned at least in, in those records. Yeah, thank you for that um, really great question. I mean, so part of the question around yeast production involves a recognition that this is happening uh, amid the backdrop of prohibition and amid the backdrop of the sort of temperance movement and the women's Christian temperance organizations, you know, sort of moving against uh, sort of alcohol in the United States. And so through companies in the United States are very excited to produce yeast and to sell it to the U.S. Public Health Service, which will then distribute it uh, to disaster zones. And so there's all of these contracts back and forth between um, Pabst Brewing Company in Milwaukee and uh, folks at the U.S. Public Health Service, the Surgeon General, you know, negotiating over prices and how much they're willing to pay for this yeast and how they're going to transport it. So the logistics is really um, a big part of this conversation. But the, the greater hurdle, of course, is having to convince polygra patients that yeast 
yeast actually can serve as food. And this is actually a campaign that the public health service undertakes, not particularly successfully. And they do a number of studies again, and just are unable to overcome the issue of unpalatability. Um, and so you see sort of a resurgence by the 1930s of home gardening, home demonstration work happening under the auspices of extension and things like this. I think largely in response to pushback over this attempt in the 1920s to force yeast onto plague or patient. So thanks for that question. Um, thank you all so much for um, your presentations. Um, I think like Dr. Dillahunt Holloway mentioned, um, just thinking about how timely and relevant are, I'm wondering, I guess, how you see the role of your work um, or your own role as a scholar in sort of like interfacing with um, these current moments and movements and issues. Um. I think, yeah, I think I've said it before, so I'll just say it again to, to home it in, in that the I'm in awe of the of the activist and community organizing work that's happening right now to tear down structures that are hurting people. And I think that my work or the perspective that I've spoken about today can just help that cause to bring people on board, <laughs> to show that the bet, like the inception of these institutions and these programs, that some of them we wouldn't think, some of them we think are just to help people. Um, but that they're actually just helping a very specific group of people and are pushing out others. Um, that's where I that's where I hope my work can can help or that perspective can help with this the current movement. I can jump in really briefly. Thanks for that question. I mean, I think that we are seeing a resurgence of freedom farms, of urban farming, of sort of moving agriculture back to people producing the foods that they're eating. And in part, this is a response to sort of uh, the corporate takeover of the food industry and ways in which people are deeply unsettled by by how that all of that works. But I would also point to the incredible role of lawsuits um, in this kind of story and holding things accountable. So the last sort of chapter of my book Book actually looks at lawsuits that were undertaken against the U.S. Department of Agriculture in the 1960s concerning access to food stamps, access to agricultural subsidies, and these sorts of things, really holding uh, the USDA accountable for this very long and very um, racist history of, of not granting food access. Um, and so I think there's a role to be said for, for the role of law and sort of holding these institutions accountable. So thanks. Yeah, I guess very similarly to Dr. Lindris, I think uh, a lot of my work is sort of centered around sort of holding uh, corporations and sort of legislators who ally with agribusiness uh, or their predecessors sort of accountable for uh, what they're doing. I think also uh, in terms of thinking about how we feed uh, an ever-growing population sort of uh, with alternatives to fertilizer as well, uh, or how we can sort of use it in a way that's not causing harm to specific populations. Um, I don't have a great answer for it yet, but I'm working on it, so. All right, so that concludes our session. Let's give a round of applause to this great session. And onward to scholarship on the South uh, that helps transform the South. Um, before you all get up, um, there is lunch upstairs. There are bag lunches in the Farrington, um, everybody. There should be enough for everybody. Um, you can eat in Farrington.